All right, so I'll, I'll let you begin with your introduction to the series. <laughs> Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for the first event in our 40 years of queer BIPOC feminism series, which is part of our programming theme, Care for the Future, for this year. I'm Maria Murphy, and I'm the Associate Director at the Center for Research in Feminist, Queer, and Transgender Studies here at Penn, and I'd like to begin our event with a land acknowledgement. In an effort to recognize both the historical and ongoing practices of colonization, we wish to affirm that the FQT Center and Program in Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at the University of Pennsylvania occupies the traditional unceded lands of the Leni Lenape. We wish to acknowledge the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together in this community that, while virtual today, is based out of Philadelphia. Our year at the center dedicated to care work is part of an ongoing effort to recognize and redress our own individual and institutional place in settler colonialism and to better understand care work as necessarily informed by indigenous epistemologies. We wish to express gratitude for the range of indigenous knowledges that disrupt notions of ownership, not only concerning land sovereignty, uh, but also knowledges that inform fundamental understandings of interconnection and collective liberation. These are themes that might be particularly meaningful to think about during our event today, which seeks to pay homage to work predicated on collective modes of care and imagining more just possibilities for care in the future. In line with these efforts, we continue to work toward disrupting settler understandings of land and environment that rationalize claims to land as property, in particular by working with Penn for Pilots, the staff and faculty group that's advocating for Penn as the largest private property owner in Philadelphia, to participate in a payments in lieu of taxes program to pay their fair share to Philly's public schools. This is an issue we like to encourage the FQT GSWS community to follow closely especially in light of Penn's recent announcement to partner with and invest in uh, or invest nearly five million dollars in Henry C. Lee Elementary. Following the existing partnership with Penn Alexander School to, in part, make West Philadelphia a so-called more attractive place for Penn faculty and students to live. Again, the Penn Lee partnership was established without a public process to consider the displacement implications of Penn's interventions into individual public schools and the needs of public schools in West Philly more broadly. We also encourage everyone in the FQT GSWS community to check out resources and events from natives at Penn and consider signing the petition for Penn to formally recognize Indigenous Peoples Day by adding it to the university calendar. And I'll share this link in the chat shortly. We also want to voice our support for the request from natives at Penn asking the university to hire a full-time staff member through University Life to support native students in our community as part of other efforts to hire and retain indigenous staff and faculty. Thank you. It's my pleasure now to turn this event over to the FQT GSWS director, Melissa Sanchez. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Maria, for, for that you know, wonderful introduction to the series as well as, as to our commitments um, to social and economic justice in at Penn and in West Philadelphia. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers briefly, and I think that I will go ahead and introduce each speaker before, um, before she speaks. So I will, we are going alphabetically. So I will begin with Candace Chu, who is Professor of English, American Studies, and Critical Social Psychology at the CUNY Graduate Center, where she is also a member of the MA in Liberal Studies faculty and affiliate faculty to the Africana Studies program. Chu is the author of The Difference Aesthetics Makes on the Humanities After Man and Imagine Otherwise on Asian Americanist Critique which won the American Studies Association's Laura Romero Book Award. She's also the co-editor with, with Karen Shimakawa of Orientations, Mapping Studies in the Asian Diaspora. Her current research focuses on Asian racialization in the era of globalization. Take it away, Candace. 
Thank you. Um, and thank you, Melissa and uh, Maria, for the invitation to um, uh, to take part in this conversation and in this series that you're that the center is running this year. It's really um, a pleasure and an honor to be here um, and in Christina Leon and, and Amber Musser's company. Um, I'm immensely delighted to think and talk with all of you today. Thank you also everyone who's attended um, for creating space for this. Um, and yet another Zoom event, which is always an exhausting thing. And so um, um, I'm particularly grateful to you. Um, I have, I, I'm going, going to share my screen in a moment. Um, but as we begin, um, I wanted to start with this. I have for a few years now been the executive officer, which is our version of chair of the PhD program in English at the CUNY Graduate Center. In that capacity, and since we went into virtual mode in March 2020, I've customarily opened our program events by asking us to pause, and in that pause with deliberation, to bring to mind the people who are always with us even in their physical absence. I'd like to ask this us, today's us, to do the same, to remember deliberately the people who have made you and us and this convening possible. This may be family, however defined, friends or comrades, colleagues or caregivers, and certainly might include your teachers and students, who are sometimes one and the same. And perhaps especially on this occasion from those from whom and with your feminist consciousness was raised. I mean also to remember into this space the hideous histories and ongoing conditions of indigenous dispossession um, where I am also as where uh, Maria was, was uh, locating um, the center um, of the Leni Lenape who continue to fight for sovereignty and enslaved and exploited labor that underpin the present, which is to say, to remember the many people unknown to us whose difficult lives make the present possible. As I know with some regularity during what has been now several years of isolation and separation for many of us, we are always a crowd, even when physically apart from others. This way of opening seems particularly apt given the work of um, Bridge and Brave, I apologize for the shorthands of these two volumes, but um, I'm going to use those throughout. Um, and the occasion of this gathering to reflect on the past 40 years as a way of also, as a way also of thinking care for the future to name the center's theme for this year. It is also related to the impact of these projects and genealogies they represent on my thinking and how I conceive of my work as a teacher and scholar, which describes the explicit brief for today. I'll move to explaining how more specifically in a moment, but wanted to note at the outset that I've interpreted that brief as an invitation to enunciate the ongoing residences and affordances of these, program, of these projects. I believe they are vital projects in the fullest senses of the term, lively, full of life and critical to life giving. And again, my thanks to Melissa and Maria for prompting me to revisit this work in this intentional way. So, <clears throat> Um, I have three nuggets to share, plus a brief closing note to offer to this discussion today. And they come of my work as teacher, scholar, and currently department chair. I note also that I draw most heavily on my engagement with Bridge, though the work, uh, though the work of Brave keeps company here as well. Um, and the title, and I don't know that we needed to have a title, but just comes from one of the introductions um, Sheree Moraga wrote, I think to the 2015 edition. Um, where she simply just asks, now what, and now what? So one, we are always a crowd. The vision of radical third world feminism necessitates our willingness to work with those people who would feel at home in El Mundo Zurdo, the left-handed world, the colored, the queer, the poor, the female, the physically challenged, ultimately we must struggle together. Together we form a vision that spans from the self-love of our colored skins to the respect of our foremothers who kept the embers of revolution burning, to our reverence for the trees, the final reminder of a rightful place on this planet. Gloria Anzaldua. How I cherish this collection of cables, SOSs, conjurations, and fusil missiles, its motive force, its gathering us in this, its midwifery of mutually wise understandings, its promise of autonomy and community, and its pledge of an abundant life for us all. Blackfoot, Amiga, Nise, Hermana, Down Home, Up, Suf, Sista, Sister, El Barrio, Suburbia, Korea, the Bronx, Lakota, Menominee, Cubana, Chinese, Puerto Rican, 
reservation, Chicana, Campanera, and letters, testimonials, poems, interviews, essays, journals, journal entries, sharing, uh, sharing sisters of the yam, sisters of the rice, sisters of the corn, sisters of the plantain, putting in telecalls to each other, and we're all on the line. Tony K. Bambara. We are always a crowd, and I believe part of our work is to bring forward that truth, that fundamental state of being, and in ways resistant to liberal models of multicultural celebration. Look at how Tony K. Bambara gives us an us by refusing the comma, the grammatical itemization, in favor of an all in, all in and at onceness, but without diminishing specificity. Indeed, the core intention of Bridge to facilitate the creation of connections among black, brown, yellow, red, and white toward revolutionary ends, and its core insight that such revolution requires such connections and of various kinds, practical, pedagogical, domestic, intellectual, international, janitorial, poetic, and prophetic among them, remains yet and still vital and inspirational, as well as demanding and difficult. What does it take to come to the table, to stay or return despite difference and disagreement, but also despite the demands of the rest of our lives? What does it take to bring others to the table, to see difference and separation as, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore has noted, points of contact as much as partition? A bridge gets walked over, Moravin notes, as she acknowledges the exhausting nature of this work of confronting significant differences and moving through them. What if, though, we begin with the we, if the bridge or the link or what I and others refer to as relationality or entanglement itself is taken to be the point of departure rather than something that needs to be achieved? Or in other words, what if we begin with recognition of the fundamental interrelation that gives us the we always before an I? This question, which has been a preoccupation of mine in writing and otherwise, I understand in this present context to be an affordance of bridge of the work of this project and of the people comprising it in insisting on the necessity of we and the thinking and activities that that insistence helped to set in motion. When we begin with we, with the fact of the bridge, we become responsible to and for each other in the ways of the left-handed world. At least that's the hope. To be sure, there is no guarantee that the elimination of radical entanglement will be enough to activate responsibility to and for each other. But it is, I think, a way of bringing forward something like an aesthetic, or perhaps better in this context, a consciousness of mutuality against the mandate to individuality that continues to be the dominant mode. I feel this acknowledgement of entanglement to be an urgency and a reality, this need to acknowledge our crowdedness, undoubtedly in part in response to neoliberalism's intensification of belief in possessive individuality as the natural and ideal state of humanity. Crowdedness, too, helps emphasize the inadequacy of knowledge practices compartmentalized according to received geographies, periods, and seemingly discrete subjects. Moreover, and immediately, I relate the urgency of acknowledging the crowdedness in relation to the attention pronouns have gotten as a queer and feminist matter, and how they, as pronoun, makes good and perhaps even best sense of default, given the crowdedness of every being. Without foregoing attention to the distinctiveness of lives and experiences and histories that give meaning to such categories as woman and lesbian and queer of color, the overt openness of bridge to envisioning a future for all of us potentially affords the elaboration of a third world woman of color queer feminism capacious enough to hold trans with care. What connects woman to trans to lesbian to queer? Follow the bridge and what we find, as Maria Lugones, among others, has argued, is the responsibility colonialism bears for the introduction and compulsory naturalization of the dichotomous and hierarchized rendering of gender and sex familiar to us as cis heteronormativity. It is for me as yet impossible to conceive of letting go of women of color and queer of color as harbors necessary to minoritarian life and politics. They refer to resting places of sorts, to the kind of intellectual psychic spaces where we don't have to be quite so prepared for the insult and injury against which we brace ourselves as a matter of course in our public lives. These are spaces materially located in hallway encounters, coffee shops, elevators, bars, informal, transitional, often temporary, as well as in books and essays and poetry and music and articles and art. However informal or short an encounter, they hold us, hold me, with a kind of sustaining power evinced everywhere across both bridge and brave. 
How is it possible they don't operate similarly for the trans subject? What must shift in order to make it do so? Bouncing around in my head is Christos writing in Bridge. I don't understand those who turned away from me. And Max Wolf Valerio publishing as Anita Valerio in the original edition. I decided to remain a girl and make the best of it. Surely we can create a world that offers more than just making do. I want to think through and understand better my and our attachment to gender. What does third world women of color queer feminism look like, prioritize, thematize, given the perhaps all gender and or ungendered nature of crowdedness of they and us? Two, what is education when it is not feminist? What each of us needs to do about what we don't know is go look for it. Shere Moraga quoted by Atsue Yamada. There is a political savviness, some difference in attitude, I think, between black and white feminists. I think what it is, is like the surprise factor. There's virtually no black person in this country who is surprised about oppression. Barbara Smith, across the kitchen table. I've asked versions of this question in a variety of settings. What is education when it is not feminist, when it is not anti-racist, when it's not anti or decolonial? I've done so out of a genuine, if skeptical curiosity as to what others think is the content of the unmarked side, as well as a political and theoretical concern regarding the compartmentalization of knowledge. Often, the context for such questions is a discussion about curriculum and how it should reflect diversity, equity, and inclusion, or about the establishment of initiatives, task forces, and or committees charged with diversity. All this will be too familiar, uh, will be all too familiar to anyone working in the academy. Roderick Ferguson, of course, has written extensively of the uses of administrative categories like women's studies and ethics studies to segregate transformative knowledge and contain its radical energies. Relatedly, and prompted initially by an invitation to consider the futures of feminist education for an academic conference held now many years ago, and repeatedly more recently by these curricular and administrative occasions to consider the segregation of knowledge, I keep thinking, shouldn't all education be feminist? And here I note that when I use and conceive of feminism, I'm referring always to women of color and black feminism. If not, what, what are we implying or even stating outright about the part of education not designated as feminist or anti-racist and so on? Aren't we working in academic context to produce a kind of redundancy such that feminism and education are meshed inextricably together? The importance of my office makes me have to move. Um, this is not at all to argue against explicitly feminist curricula or to pull forward, um, but some of us are brave, the establishment of centers and research itineraries and fields and so on dedicated to the thematization of black women's lives as Brittany Cooper enjoins in the afterward to the new edition, for example. Rather, it is to suggest as part of what it means to create and sustain spaces of study emergent from and organized around illuminating the world as experienced from the embodied realities of racialized and gendered people is that we hold a mirror up to perhaps especially the well-meaning majoritarian modes of knowledge work. Undoubtedly, it is that I've spent my professional life in English departments that underwrites this thought. One of the things I appreciate so much about both Bridge and Brave is their emphasis on and belief in education and the non-inevitability of ignorance. Learning and unlearning and education broadly emerge as necessary and necessarily political activities and ones that are variously invigorating, exhausting, and sometimes simply tiresome. I lacked in wry recognition in reading freshly some of the uh, experiences recounted in Bridge and Brave of people's anger over not the fact of anti-Asian racism, but rather of having learned of it, of the dismissal of insight and knowledge regarding Black history, culture, and life by establishment intellectuals, of the push to and the impossibility of assimilation given linguistic and cultural and skin differences voiced across the writings of the brown, Asian and indigenous subjects represented. And of the logaria that is the narration of the latest reading in or experience of, in my case, anything Asian related by well-meaning and well-intended and sometimes quite beloved white women. Over 40 years, some things have changed and others not so much. In the aftermath, of the March 2021 murders and spa and massage parlors in Atlanta of eight people, six of whom were women of Asian descent. I experienced the curious and unsettling phenomenon of having non-Asian, mostly white people reach out to me with declarations of love accompanied by expressions of shock and dismay at the violence. 
Given that anti-Asian violence spurred on by the last and unapologetically hate-mongering US president has been framed as a problem of hate, that love seems the solution makes some rhetorical sense. But my own unquestionable lovability aside, the experience set my ears twitching. I understood that part of what was happening could be explained as an effect of racial essentialism, which provides for the illusions that collapse the manifold significant differences between me and the women killed in Atlanta into a baggy, all-encompassing category of Asian woman. I also understand what was happening. Uh, I also understood what was happening as a version of what Mitsue Yamada recounts of the anger she experienced from students learning for, for the first time of anti-Asian racism uh, through the militant tone of the IE anthology's introduction. Their anger made me angry because I didn't even know the Asian Americans felt oppressed. I didn't expect their anger, Yamada reports of a student's response to the anthology. Cast as inappropriate subjects of racism, the fact of anti-Asian racism and or that Asian Americans might respond to it comes as, something, uh, as sometimes infuriating and sometimes sympathy provoking surprise. I admit to intellectualization as a coping mechanism. In this context, what that means is a derivation of the question, who is or gets to be surprised by racist violence? And what does it tell us that 50 years after the establishment of Asian American studies and other ethnic studies formations in US university, there is still surprise at the fact of anti-Asian violence. I am reminded in this context of Catherine McKittrick's discussion in Demonic Grounds of the impact of the deeply embedded presumption of blacklessness in Canada. This, despite the thick and well-established scholarship and evidence to the contrary. I think also in this light of the BRAVE project and the heavy lifting it does to create a field of knowledge, to provide abundant resources such that we can recognize ignorance of Black feminist and women's life and history, culture, and aesthetics as a decidedly willful ignorance. What we know from third world Black women of color feminism is that the terms that comprise this ungainly but powerful formulation are epistemological as much as they are political. They help us apprehend the world and how it works and for whom and at what cost to what others. I wonder what might happen if we let them fly in the intellectual and social spaces beyond their designated institutional arenas. I wonder if we might puncture ignorance, ruin the surprise, maybe even raise a consciousness or two. Perhaps then, the global circuits of capital and long-lived histories of imperialism that converged to create the migratory pathways by which the six women were implotted in Atlanta and the white male shooter with a weapon made available by the state-supported multi-billion dollar gun industry was moved to kill them might take place of hate as explanation. Three, the political is impersonal. The political is profoundly personal, Sheree Maraga. If hate or love is not the fullest answer to, the understand, to understanding the problem of anti-Asian gendered racism, I believe neither is the call for greater visibility mounted variously by Moro Wu, Mitsui Yamada, and Nellie Wong, the, representative, uh, of the representatives of the Asian American women and lesbian subjectivities in the bridge volume. Within the context of their writing, that their consideration of political activity organized around Asianness and feminism would express in terms of visibility makes absolute sense. The 70s and 80s, after all, were a cresting time of identity and representational politics within and among progressive movements. Without their heavy lifting toward these ends, and in conjunction with others like King Kok Chung, Sao Ling Wong, and Elaine Kim, I know absolutely I, I know absolutely I and so many other Asian American women and Asian American feminism would have no place in the academy. And we know also that visibility is fraught that the terms by which one is made legible may well not be of our own choosing or design, nor of a design oriented toward liberation. Visibility is also fraught in light of the ways that racialized and gendered subjects are always overread as if the body transmits unmediated knowledge. C. Riley Snorton's Nobody is Supposed to Know offers us a brilliant account of the problems of invisibility for the black, gendered, and sexualized subject that keeps company with me here. And of course, it's undeniable that police and other forms of state surveillance rely on visibility to the hard detriment of racialized subjects. Certainly, the manifold critiques of the politics of visibility inform my reading and response on this point. I understand, though, my own disinclination toward it as related to my attachment to inscrutability, to impersonality, 
which explains the awkward making diacritics I've attached to the political is impersonal. In contrast to the more familiar form of the phrase, the personal is political, Moraga's inversion helps me understand my discomfort with the place of the personal as a key ground of feminist politics. Even more specifically, it is the elicitation of personal narratives as the mode by which certain ideas and issues and indeed subjects are made visible that, even while I recognize its utility and perhaps even necessity, I also recognize as a prickly matter for me. I think it is because personality can be so heavy a mantle to carry, the demand to be likable, interesting, engaging and engaged, to be funny and smart and kind that I'm wary of. Must we be likable to deserve care, to be considered feminist? Must we even be good subjects? I've elsewhere written of the importance of impersonality as a pedagogical matter, of not letting students know whether or not I like them. This in part because I'm acutely aware of how the imposter syndrome operates through explanations like, I was hired because they liked me. I got a good grade because she liked me. But also because I believe there's a beautiful kind of lightness that accompanies the ability to, just for a while, the duration of a class session perhaps, allow yourself to forget the self and focus in on an idea, a conversation, a problem. This is, I submit, not, a, not proposing a transcendence of body or corporeal knowledge, but instead describing a bracketing of judgment of whether that knowledge is good enough, feminist enough, anti-racist enough. As a political matter, I worry over the need for personal knowledge as the ground and motivation for giving care. This is how old boys networks operate, right? Who, who you know matters more than what you do or, or more, more than um, what you do or know. Caring for those unknown to us, caring for those whose lives are led far away in time and space, but who are understood to be fundamentally entangled with us nonetheless care without regard to personality, and instead just because of existence, care without identification. Why tell me I'm loved only in the face of the murders of Asian women? Why not in the light of the people, the children caged at the US Southwestern borders, or the disappearance of native women that give rise to the Idle No More movement, or the deaths of black people at the hands of the state that despite having fallen off the front pages are nonetheless occurring? Or, and UG, in the face of the all too endless stream of violence unfolding across the world, the impact of which is always greater on women and queers, history has shown us. Is there room in third world women of color queer feminism for a politics of impersonality, for the development of a theory of care based on entanglement and mutuality? And finally, the other illusion is that revolution is neat. It's not pretty, it's not neat or pretty or quick. It is a long, dirty process, Pat Parker, revolution. I don't imagine I will live to see the revolution, Moraga writes in the introduction to the 2015 edition. She continues, I smile at the arrogance of this, that we imagine that our work begins and ends with us. I'm struck by the fact that she and Gloria and Zeldero were in their 20s when they created their original edition, that in that moment, they were moved by the quote, pending promise inscribed by all of us who believe that revolution physical and metaphysical at once is possible. I read these lines and I wonder, isn't the revolution underway? Aren't we in the thick of it? Aren't we living the end times of racial capitalist and colonial modernity collapsing as it is under the weight of its own greedy devastation of the planet? Haven't we seen signs of revolutionary life everywhere among people working on the ground in mutual aid? It isn't enough, of course, too many people are dying and being killed in too many places to say nothing of the decimation of biodiversity and planetary well being. And it's an especially ugly arrogance to deny a difference between revolutionary ways of thinking and living and the fact of impoverishment and suffering that feels none of their impact. I have to admit that I do believe yet and still that revolution is possible. I think in part because it's inconceivable to me that the status quo can continue. And in part because there's so much inspiring, smart, courageous world making work that has been done and is being done both in and mostly out of academic settings toward the ends of radical transformation. I think sometimes about the implausibility that the project that is Bridge or that the work that is Black, uh, Black women's and feminist studies as elaborated and brave should exist at all. And I recognize how much labor has gone into making possible what was implausible. Isn't the transformation of the implausible into the possible a material sign of revolution underway? I'll end my remarks with these borrowed from Kate Russian. 
Keep moving, keep breathing, stop apologizing and keep talking. When you get scared, keep talking anyway. Tell the truth like Sojourner Truth. Spill all the beans, let all the cats out of all the bags. Thank you, Candace, that was beautiful. I'm so glad that we're recording this that I can go back and listen to it again. Um, our next speaker is um, Christina Leon, who is assistant professor of English, Spanish, and, and Spanish and Portuguese, as well as um, affiliated with the programs of American Studies, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Latin American Studies at Princeton. Professor Leon is completing her first monograph currently entitled Opaque Entanglements, the Matter of Reading Caribbean Latinidad, which traces entanglements of matter and metaphor in the work of feminist and queer writers and artists from Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Latinx New York. She is also editor of a special issue of Women in Performance entitled Lingering in Latinidad, his theory, aesthetics, and performances in Latina O women's Latina O studies. Her research and teaching center literary and critical theory in concert with anti-colonial, critical ethnic, and critical race theory. Um, thank you so much for being here today, Christina. Thank you. Let me just share my screen, which is not wanting me to do. So let me see if I can do this one more time. I'm still very not great at this. Let's see if this works. Okay. Actually, I'm just going to stop and I'll go ahead and read in, in, in favor of time because I have a new machine and I haven't figured it out at all, but it's smarter than I am. So Maybe it'll if pop. If you want to, you can take a second to do it. We're, we're all used to the, yeah, the I, strangeness of it's Zoom. It's telling me I would have to go into system preferences. And I know that that is not my preference right now uh, because I'm terrible at multitasking. So let me um, go ahead and start. Um, with my piece. And um, let me, as I'm starting, say, of course, thank you to Echo. Candace's thank yous um, to Maria and Melissa for inviting me to um, to give to be part of this conversation, especially with my co-panelists Candace and Amber, from whom I feel very humbled to be in conversation with, and from whom I have learned so much um, that is in the spirit of Bridge. Um, and I want to thank all of you for being here. I'll keep my remarks mostly to Bridge and more specifically to specific positionalities of Sherry Moraga and Bridge. Um, but I want to look at the place that it's held in my thinking vis-a-vis -vis attention to positionality and anthology and attention that teaches me about pedagogy and how pedagogy and feminist, feminism to me are intimately bound. This Bridge called my back as well as all the women are white and all the men are black, but some of the, us are brave, were part of a matrix of a slew of constellation of publications that cropped up, written in the late 70s, published in the early 80s, before we really had the full weight of the HIV AIDS crisis upon us, when third world feminisms and black feminisms engaged in a risky dialogue and a writing and publishing praxis that requires a revisitation of these foundational books as both dated and urgent, as both holding eclipsed dreams and enduring lessons. These books come out of a matrixial site questioning neat silos of difference, language and place while also knowing how much positionality matters. The book Bridge is fondly called Bridge by its followers, and it's an extraordinary collection first published in 1981 by Sherry Moraga and Gloria Anzaldúa, and closely thereafter, um, but some of us are brave. The book itself has gone out of print several times for several years, which found many of us, the students of Bridge, counting on coarse packets, the texture of which now makes me very nostalgic, and later, um, to quote Candace Ugg, PDFs. My first copy of Bridge was bought during my PhD program, which centered deconstructionist thought, and I was craving uh, the earlier lessons of women of color feminism, third world feminism, and black feminism. 
I purchased these at Karis Bookstore and a feminist bookstore in Atlanta, Georgia, and I think each of them cost me about $75. I say multiple copies because Karis had both the English version and the translation, Este Puente Mi Espalda. And if my computer was working, you would see pictures of both of them side by side. The collection is as much coalition as it is tension, an earnest theory of the flesh that braves to speak truths in bold letters, essays, testimonio, poetry, lyric, SOSs, and assemblages therein. It anticipates explorations of ugly feelings and creates intersectional conversations before either became standards in the academy. Indeed, the ugly feelings and the intra and interpersonal often take the form of rage, anger, guilt, shame, and racism, racism both structural and psychic. The tapestry of bridge is complex, it isn't predetermined, it unfolds roughly, tied at times, disjointed at others. There may, be, there may be a strange parallelism grappled through a lover's discourse across skin, Moraga's La Guerra alongside Anzaldúa's La Prieta, the Kambahi River Collective alongside and as a vital part of third world feminism. And like any good feminist collection, it makes one pause, at times crushed by the articulation of a feeling felt, but not yet known before. And it can also make one rush, inspired by the fire of honesty and the erotics of anger, one we may well feel in institutions and conferences. It strikes me how many of the authors in both texts think about institutionality so much that it could be a precursor to what we now call university studies. And the fourth edition of Bridge in 2015 by SUNY begins with a note of how, though its lessons may endure, it is dated, asking us to take stock of what's happened in the bridge of time between its first print and now. Moraga encourages readers to read this collection as dated. She writes, quote, I am honored to reintroduce this collection of 1981 testimonies for the very reason that it is, in fact, dated, marked by the hour and place of these writers and artists' births our geographies of dislocation and homecoming. Moraga reminds us, quote, it is not always a matter of the actual bodies in the room, but of a life dedicated to a growing awareness of who and what is missing in that room and responding to that absence. What ideas never surface because we imagine we already have all the answers, end quote. And this, I think, choruses beautifully with Candace's talk. So in my youth uh, at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida, in my punk adjacent undergraduate years, I say punk adjacent because I think being in um, constant classwork kind of put me out of the realm of super punk. I first encountered the words of Gloria Anzaldúa and Sherry Moraga, Bell Hooks and Kimberly Crenshaw, Patricia Hook Collins, Ana Castillo, Gayatri Spivak. I, Lisa Lowe, I took classes on Latina feminism from white non-Latina professors who accounted in the, late or in the style of the late 90s for their standpoint, noting their whiteness, noting their commitment to thinking beyond the strictures of a myopic white bourgeois feminism. But what was my standpoint? I was the daughter of a light-skinned Cuban immigrant who was white in Cuba and landed in Miami in 1960 being called a spick the daughter, too, of a gringa from the agrarian orange groves of Central Florida who defied her Southern Baptist family by having a second marriage, making the sign of the cross at supper after grace. My brother, white, gay, working as a nurse in the HIV, HIV AIDS pandemic, three people who loved and hurt each other tremendously. Who was I and who was I aligned with? I am a nerd, and so college was my late bloom, my late arrival, a life of feminist reading that still rereads over those missteps, but also revisits old concepts with care. In my youth, I was finding my way with the blaze of rebellion, but I was also skeptical of Anzaldúa's corporeal writings and perhaps even more wary of anything that didn't sound like gender performativity I was chasing after, trying to understand, thinking that application and resonance were vital to feminist theory. I, I was wrong. I turned away from too much body, too much nature. I watched a documentary on Mendieta, Ana Mendieta, and wondered why in the world she'd align herself with nature so fully. Didn't she know the danger in this alignment? You see, my anti-essentialist impulses were trained and also underthought, racist in articulation in the feminist classroom that was framed by whiteness, thinking that it may be possible for some to not think of the body of theory and the flesh. 
It was only years later when I taught on the Mendieta, years later after having lived in San Francisco at Emory University in a library viewing room that I wept in spite of myself for the first time. The kind of crying while teaching that often means you need to turn to the board or your notes, look lost in thought when actually you're dumping tears into the back of your skull. Teaching the 1987 documentary Fuego de Tierra in 2010, I was surprised at seeing the art anew as an art of longing, of desire, of a fiery third world feminist who, silo, who, do, who defied silos and convention. Her work criticized white feminism, camping up her Caribbean-ness on her voicemail, referring to herself as Tropic Ana. She knew her frame and pushed against it. Mendieta may have been the closest thing to me that I found in my education, and at first I pushed her away. But this is also to say that teaching and pedagogy made me more honest, more raw. Other pedagogical scenes would follow as these, taking students to Cuba for the first time, coming out to my immigrant father, feeling the force of the body when unwell. And what kept me afloat and charged was teaching Caribbean, queer, Latinx, and always feminist courses for which I got some pretty nasty reviews when they weren't explicitly feminist in name. In this, it seems I return to bridge and brave is profoundly pedagogical because teaching requires the slow down, the return, the excavation of terms, the contextual etymology to explain what third world women meant then, what women of color might mean now, what the legacies are, what the tensions are with black feminism, with indigenous feminisms. But also because Bridge and Brave are bracingly earnest and honest. Each prologue, each letter admits failure, frustration, hurt, but also missing voices. In this tenor, allow me to return to one essay, La Guerra, where Moraga, a halfy like and unlike me, details some of her position as the light-skinned one. She talks of the love of her mother, of her education and gringeria or whiteness, and how she wore this privilege as pride until she, quote, lifted the lid of her lesbianism. This labial alliteration flows and the poetry performs here. She moves on to say that this opened her up to danger, to visceral violence on the streets, and from there her consciousness grew to know a few lines that I revisit now. Quote, in this country, lesbianism is a poverty, as is being brown, as is being a woman as is being just plain poor. The danger lies in ranking the oppression. The danger lies in failing to acknowledge the specificity of the oppression. This last line italicized echoes alongside the other boldly quotable moments in Bridge and Brave. But does the equivalence here in Morago's words herald another danger? Can we acknowledge the specificity and operate on analogy? Put another way, how are we still in the danger of identifying too soon with another's plight and implotment in this modern grammar of gender and race to signal to spillers? The next page, Moraga undoes some of this an analogous thinking with the raw line quote, and yet I really don't understand firsthand what it feels like to be shitted on for being brown, end quote. I'll repeat, and yet, I don't really understand firsthand what it feels like to be shitted on for being brown, end quote. Neither do I, and this is not a virtue signal. Morago goes on to talk about the need for dialogue, for collective conversation with caveats about her role in the larger project. I have many times questioned my right to even work on the anthology, which is to be written, quote, exclusively by third world women. I have had to look critically at my claim to color and at, at, at a time when among white feminist ranks, it is politically correct and sometimes peripherally advantageous assertion to make. I must acknowledge the fact physically that I have had a choice about making that claim in contrast to women who have not had such a choice and have been abused for their color. With candor and ardor, she claims that yes, in her past, she had aligned forcefully with white values in her short essay that admits raw hopes and sincere regrets. I read letter, a letter to lovers and mothers in an honest tone, one that perhaps has too much faith in comparison analogy as the relational mode for feminism. My revisitation here requires me to say aloud that I most often read as a woman of color in the academy, not in Target, not in stores, not on the streets. And it is the coincidence of what I write about and the tenuous relation to my last name, a name that signals class and race privilege in Cuba and an exceptional path to citizenship underscored by the H in my first name, my father's choice, not my mother's. 
It is to say that my roots have not been a font for resistance or dissent, but rather it is through feminism most acutely that I have been able to examine my positionality and to potentially forge alliances not based on equivalence. A note on Moraga here too. I am enduringly grateful for her words and those who read her well enough to challenge her risky speech and questionable claims. I am also mindful of the enduring lessons beyond publishing held in the wisdom of Kitchen Table Press, of the shopping of the manuscript, of the creation of spaces apart that created more gatherings with access. Moraga notes that in July 20 of 1980 in her journal, a book by radical women of color, the left needs it with shaky and shabby record of commitment to women, period. Oh yes, it can claim its attention to color issues embodied in the male. Sexism is acceptable to the white left publishing house. End quote. This sounds now like the scramble for content, the request to help diversify or worse, decolonize a syllabus. If decolonization is not merely a metaphor, then Bridge and Brave asks us to consider not the telos of the D, but the lingering traces, the entanglements of coloniality. Yet such traces always run the risk of sedimenting categories, beliefs, and origin myths of the prelapsarian gender bliss before colonial contact, undoing the complexity of all peoples in process, unwittingly making a two-spirit indigenous person, a person of the past, an ancestor here to correct the trans invasion of feminism and lesbianism. And here I'm referring to the 2009 Moraga um, essay where she goes on to make a, a sharp border between feminism and queer feminism and trans people. Francisco Galarte in particular has read the spirit of Chicana feminism to think with and beyond Moraga, noting that her critiques of particularly medical transitioning collapse all transness into one form, medical, hormonal, and also erect a border in queer studies, invisibilized trans women. He writes, quote, Moraga's text forces transgender folks to bear the burden of proving loyalty to a nation as well as being the figure that is the exemplar of sex, race, and gender abjection and liberation, end quote. And at the same time, we've seen decades of Black, Indigenous, feminist, and queer of color critique thrown in the face of homonationalism, same-sex marriage, militarism. And many, including Barbara Smith, have left openly queer movements. She writes, quote, I prefer to put my energy into multi-issue organizing. In the late 1970s and 1980s, I co-founded the Kambahi River Collective, a Black feminist group, and Kitchen Table Women of Color Press to give women of color, lesbians of color, and even gay men of color a voice. One in four people in LGBTQ community experienced food insecurity in 2017. 24% of lesbians and bisexual women earn less than the federal poverty line. LGBTQ youth have 120% higher risk of experiencing homelessness than heterosexual cisgender youth. These statistics show it is not possible to achieve justice in a vacuum, end quote. Here, Barbara Smith reminds us of Kathy Cohen's trenchant work, reminding us that a militant queer stance as articulated in the 90s by Queer Nation could not shore up heterosexism, could not attest for the many perfectly heterosexual women who live well outside of the comforts of heteronormative privilege. So what remains as enduring lessons can be read back upon Moraga, back upon my earlier misreadings as feminist form of recursive reading that requires us to account for received taxonomies, disciplines, names. And what becomes really refreshing, humbling is the constant state of hypervigilance in Bridge about one's limitations, one's privileges, one's hurts, one's institutional standing, one's family, one's precarious status. And so the collective, the structural is called upon so that we can learn ways of being not built upon the over representation of man to think with Sylvia Winter. Earnestness, commitment, risk, while sometimes queer, sometimes decolonial, these affected and committed structures resonate for me forcefully as a deep pedagogical feminism that comes from bridge and brave. How have these matrices of publications influence my thinking? They are for me matrices of feminism, accountability, sitting with privilege, pain, and oppression, naming when race does and does not translate, perhaps in my case, in the Caribbean archive, knowing too that anti-Blackness is matrixial, that indigenous decimation is a myth and an ongoing one. It doesn't take a black body being in the room for anti-blackness to be at work. This is a challenge and a constant reminder to be hypervigilant about the perniciousness of anti-blackness, especially in English, 
especially in ethnic studies that tries to carve out a space separate from and in response to the incredible theorizing that has come out of specifically Black feminisms. As I move from my first book that centers Latinidad to a second book, on the Caribbean, I am all the more grateful for this occasion to sit again at the interstices of third world feminism, women of color feminism and black feminism that allow me to read the raw words of feminists flying in the face of fascist forces that then push back against affirmative action and now against critical race theory. It is to consider how equivalence and analogy do not emerge from reading Bridge and Brave together. So let me end on a note of gratitude as I should end pretty quickly. Um, this gratitude is held in tension and in tandem um, of the acknowledgement of so many dreams deferred, brilliant Black, Indigenous, and women of color feminists, lesbians, all um, who, have, who have passed, who are not in the room, of the eclipsed revolutions, knowing that feminist fortitude is often the effect of quotidian work at the interregnum between things we may call events that may find their way into larger grids of intelligibility and the matrices of histories that record what did happen successfully. I have to thank my co-panelists for helping me do the work of Bridge and Brave in the most humble and honest way I know how, which remains in the anti-racist feminist classroom. As a feminist teacher and student, there are so many moments of juggling questions when you won't take a single issue approach. So many methodological quandaries when you aren't tied to a discipline yet within a discipline. And it's to this that I have relied upon not only Bridge and Brave, but also the work of Amber Musser and Candace Chu. With Musser, I have always been able to rely upon her astute readings of black feminism and women of color feminism. I've always been able to have a better understanding of the history of science in order to quickly tell students, what does Horton Spillers mean by flesh? Read Amber Messer. I have also profited so much from the readings of Candace Chu's critiques of the university of both the liberal and neoliberal forces who tend to create the guise of a pedagogy of dissent, but in fact wind up just re-encoding um, the overrepresentation of man. I have also countless others to think and people I won't name, people who have told me what it feels like to grow up on the border, people who have been raw enough to tell me how hard it hurts when people thematize and intellectualize sex work but don't know what it feels like to work the streets. I've become friends and readers of people in Cuba and people in Puerto Rico who remind me that writing in a Princeton office about colonization has very little to do with the day-to-day -day battles waged in the name of survival after hurricanes and embargoes. And so I think with that, I'll just end there. I had some more poetry, but I will I'll go ahead and stop myself. Thank you so much, Christina, for that incredibly, you know, vulnerable and thoughtful presentation. I um, am so glad that you're here. Um, so our our third speaker today, um, whom I'm I'm very excited to introduce, is Amber Jamila Musser, who is professor of English at the CUNY Graduate Center. Professor Musser is the author of Sensational Flesh race, power, and masochism, and sensual as excess, queer femininity, and brown jouissance. She is also the editor of two volumes, a special issue of ASAP Journal on Queer Form, which she co-edited with Kaji Amin and Roy Perez, and Keywords for Gender and Sexuality Studies, which she co-edited as a member of the Keywords Feminist Editorial Collective. Professor Musser also writes art criticism for the Brooklyn Rail, and she's currently beginning a research project on noise. Thank you for coming today, Amber. It's such an honor to be here. Um, thank you so much, Melissa and Maria, for the invitation. I'm so happy to be in conversation with Candace and Christina. Um, I'm extending apologies. I've been pretty sick for the past, I don't know, two weeks. So my voice is a little weird and my thoughts may be a little bit jumbled, um, but I think that they flow uh, you might have to think deeply to think about what connections are happening with Bridge, so I apologize for that, but I think that they are there. Um, so without further ado, there are many ways to think about the profound effect of, of, of A Bridge Called My Back and Some of Us Are Brave. 
There is first the audacity of declaring oneself present, of announcing that one matters. This declaration that women of color have presence is something that I've been thinking about lately as I turn to think about situatedness, perhaps as a femme methodology. I'm not quite sure how to describe it, but it feels like another iteration of thinking about the knowledge that we gain from thinking robustly about the flesh. Previously, I've been interested in thinking about the way these texts through testimony have allowed us to think about difference in corporeal terms. Enabling another perspective on racial mattering, they ask, how does race impact how we feel when bodies touch? What are the histories and places summoned? The structural components of race still undergird the matter, <clears throat> still undergird the matter of race, but in addition to an abstract hierarchy of marginalization, these women of color feminisms tell us how this difference feels and invite us into it invite us to rescript prevailing narratives using these sensational differences. Now, however, I'm thinking about fleshy methodology. Denim knits in at the waist, hugging hips before loosening at the thigh to fall on the straight line to neatly disclose ankle bone and bright pink sneakers. A loose cotton button down, pinstriped and over dyed with a swirl of pastels, hangs from broad shoulders, skimming torso, but revealing clavicle, forearms, wrists, and hands. These clothes emphasize the architecture of my body, highlighting angles and curves. I am in my apartment in New York, sitting on my orange, which is, this is the couch, um, or Persimian couch writing. I pause often to turn to the right so I can see the trees and sky through the window. Unformed ideas swirl in my gut. I can feel my legs and glutes tense to guard against the gravity of the slightly sagging cushions. When I remember to relax, I also drop my chin to my chest to stretch the back of my neck where most of my headaches originate. While my outfit announces my queerness, my muscle tension illuminates habits, and the apartment, both in style and geography, locates me as a member of the middle class living in a densely populated urban area. Within feminist theory, there are many ways to interpret the equation of body and place. Simone de Beauvoir argues that the body is a situation, a set of material givens whose value shifts depending on context. While some of Beauvoir's terminology encapsulates her antipathy towards physiology, especially the impositions of menstruation, childbirth, and nursing, this framing, despite its implicit idealization of one particular mode of embodiment, highlights the ways that constraint emerges contextually. Although the social and the material are inextricable, theirs is not a deterministic relationship. Writing from science studies, Donna Haraway dispenses with the universality and objectivity produced from an omniscient, godlike view from nowhere, and argues instead for the importance of partial perspectives that are founded on an awareness of specific privilege and oppression. Here, the body is the vantage point from which one makes sense of the world. These situated knowledges, the product of epistemological, ontological, political, and ethical positions, leads, in Haraway's words, to a more adequate, richer, better account of a world in order to live in it well and in critical reflexive relation to our own, as well as others' practices of domination and the unequal parts of privilege and oppression that make up all positions. In Sarah Ahmed's account of orientation, positionality is fused with opportunity and attachment. So bodies take shape through tending towards objects that are reachable, that are available within, body, within bo the bodily horizon. These forms of extension, aversion, and movement are, Ahmed argues, how we reside in space. And this is where sort of bridge comes in. So but when we take racialization into account, the body is not necessarily a given, nor is it necessarily singular. And this non-singularity can also be indexed geographically as a placelessness. So I'm thinking about using this fleshy femme methodology for women of color feminisms to think about situatedness as a mode of repair that favors the possibilities of multiplicity and expansion over individuation. So this in turn brings me to the body place, a formulation that I argue allows us to feel for fuller modes of enfleshment, moving beyond subject object divisions and the spatial, spiritual and temporal cleavages that produce man. These dispersals of being occur at multiple scales above and below the individual while acknowledging the impossibility of separate my, <clears throat> of separating my movements from those of my extended kin and spiritual network, each relation producing conditions of possibility, forms of knowledge, as well as constraints and challenges. Here are a partial list of what the body place refuses, 
individuations that sever ancestors, spirits, and other communal affiliations, cleavages between body and environment, and modes of individuation. The body place works through the knowledge that it is impossible to separate my movements from those of my extended kin network, each relation producing conditions of possibility, forms of knowledge, as well as constraints and challenges. This dispersal of self occurs at the molecular level too. For example, each exile of mine contains pieces of me that are readily inhaled by other beings. We are all constantly engaged in processes of dis and reintegration. And I think for me, that's one of the, um, the these forms of expansion are sort of what I take from, from Bridge. So because body places call attention to the practices and politics of reincorporation based on enfleshment as being in and of the world, it is in conversation with Mishana Goman's theorization of remapping, which she defines as the, the labor native authors and the communities that they write within and, and about undertake in the simultaneously metaphoric and material capacities of map making to generate new possibilities. The framing of re with parentheses connotes the fact that in remapping, native women employ traditional and new tribal stories as a means of continuation. Goldman emphasizes both the violent disciplining of genders, intimacies, and spatiality that accompanies what she terms following Mary Lou Pratt, European planetary consciousness, and the wide array of practices that mediate and refute colonial organizing of land bodies and social and political landscapes. In Goman's textual analysis, remapping emerges as a diverse set of negotiations between violence, reclamation, and subversion. The importance of the re is that it allows Goman to contextualize these practices within particular tribal traditions and specific histories of violences. Remapping is not a utopian wish for before, but a set of engagements that draws on practices and knowledges that have been foreclosed in order to exist in the imperfect now. In this way, remapping is not curative. These are divisions and histories that cannot be undone, but they're about invigorating pasts and thinking otherwise in their myths. So like Goman's remapping, some iterations of body places may resolve into a strategic narrativization of selfhood and relation. Others, however, veer towards the disintegrative, voiding possibilities of coherence and moving around ideas of self. These political and ontological ambivalences are why shadows, noise, and their amorphous qualities are such important aesthetic and sensational categories. They enable personal practices and of enfleshed spatial, spatial and temporal organization of sensing structures of power, disavowal, and belonging, as well as highlighting what is kept illegible. So I realize that what I've been sharing, you're like, why, why it is this happening to me? Um, but a lot of this, these are excerpts for the project that I'm currently working on, um, entitled Between Shadows and Noise. And as you can tell, I'm really trying to think about what a body methodology or body work might feel like. The ethical imperative, like that of the work that subtends women of color feminisms and bridge from four years ago, is to dwell in the textures of difference to allow their specifics to unfold into their own theorizations of the world. So body places are but one iteration of how this fleshy theorizing might unfold. I also have unresolved questions, um, namely my insistence on thinking about the idea that this is an analytic of feminists um, that grows directly out of these women of color's insistence on fleshiness and intersectionality and queerness. Um, but I'm struggling to articulate what this kind of feminist means as method in a more precise way. Um, and the closest verb that I can think of is attunement. So attunement, I think, um, and this is sort of what I, I perceive the work that is happening in um, Bridge um, broadly, is about cultivating awareness of multiplicity rather than discernment. So I think of attunement specifically in relation to the hunger that I described in Lilash and Harris's Billy 21, um, in central excess. So their hunger is born out of the plural selfhood that Harris's citation of Holiday produced. This expression of hunger is, I argue, a form of brown jouissance because it comes from violence yet exceeds it by mobilizing fleshiness. In central excess, I wrote that this hunger reveals a sensuality or mode of being and relating that prioritizes openness, vulnerability, and a willingness to ingest without necessarily choosing what one is taking in. So this is not a desire born of subjectivity in which subject possesses object, but an embodied hunger that takes joy and pain in this gesture of radical openness towards otherness. 
this radical openness is what I see in attunement as allowing us towards moving, um, as allowing us to move toward. Practices of attunement build the capacity for recognizing and living with difference by foregrounding ethical forms of coexistence. This is an ethical claim that is central to the possibility of brown jurisance, but which is more fully mobilized, I think, by thinking about this fleshy methodology called forth by women of by these women of color feminisms. So in thinking about the relationship between women of color feminisms, flesh and attunement, one of the things that emerges is not only openness, but also desire. And I think this brings us back to situatedness and back to presence. The insistence on mattering and asserting presence because of want to me is where the femme comes in. My own practices, my own personal practices of attunement have begun through various practices of movement, meditation and sounding, because I don't think it's possible to theorize attunement through a pure, on a purely linguistic register. It requires multi-sensory input and attention to manifold ways that knowing and embodiment have been theorized. This means that some of these modes of entombment have been guided through more specific trainings and other systems of rationality, cosmology, and embodiment. I personally, well, you know, whatever. It's been a long pandemic. I personally trained in tarot, <laughs> Isha Kriya, and Yin Yoga, which combines yogic philosophy with Chinese traditional medicine. So these, it, these examples, and there are more now because, you know, whatever. Um, these examples are not meant to impose limits on the kinds of practices to which one can be drawn, but I am attracted to um, their invigoration of different onto epistemologies. Each of these practices has their own cosmology, system of rationality, and theory of embodiment. They're practices that have disrupted what I thought I knew about what constitutes thinking, knowledge, and being in and of the world. So through these modes of attunement, I experience modes of exploring with desire, with feminist, the multidimensionality of being. Um, and that to me, again, is sort of, this is my, alongside the lessons of thinking with bridge and what kind of what kind of method we can gain from the work um the types of exploration that i think that they did um yeah so that is that's my weird present sorry guys you can tell i'm sick it's hard but thank you thank you amber and um should say you should not apologize for, for those that you know incredibly capacious way of looking at at desire situatedness and and power I, that was that was wonderful um so again I'm I'm so grateful um that to to Candace and Christina and Amber for being here today um we have about 20 minutes left so um I'll begin just by um, flagging a few of the affinities between the the talk, some some common ground, and um, and then I'm going to open it up for um, for Q and A from the audience. And I think that what we can do for Q and A is have everyone use the hand raise function. Um, that way, you'll appear in the order. Um, uh, at which you raise your hand. So, um, you know, some of one of the one of the um, themes that I was struck by that came out um, across um, all all three papers um, was, you know, this this refusal of individuality. Um, but but at the same time. Um, an insistence on um, an assistance on resisting, you know, um, perfect commiserability or identification. Um, so, you know, so whether um, that was through Candace's really, um, I thought, beautiful formulation of um, of the the politics of impersonality. Um, and and impersonality as as an acknowledgement of entanglement, um, which also which also leaves um, leaves some space for difference, right? Um, as as against what what you refer to as as the old boys network model of call it caring for those who who are like you, um, but but from 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 Candace's formulation of of you know 
impersonal politics to um, to Christina's attention to to identification and the dangers of thinking by analogy um, as as against um, you know the the kind of hyper vigilance about difference and motive and hierarchy that that bridge models even even as um, it it fails in some some ways to um, to actually stick with um, to to Amber's thinking about um, you know racialization and the possibility of fuller accounts of enfleshment um, or a remapping that that is not necessarily um, reparative, but that may be a way of rethinking relationality and rethinking the harms that have been done in, in moving towards, um, towards a future of, of what you described as, as attunement and this, this cultivating of awareness of, um, of the possibilities of openness, of desire, of multiplicity, of situatedness. Um, so, so I wanted to begin by, by thinking about these various, um, critiques and rethinkings of, um, politics of coalition and identification and solidarity, um, to ask all of you, um, what you would see as a way forward for, um, feminist, queer, trans studies right now um, what, or feminist, queer and trans politics right now. How, how do we practice these forms of intunement, attunement or impersonality um, or, or you know what you called Christina, um, pedagogical feminisms that, that keep returning us to these eclipsed revolutions. So I will just I will leave it at that um, and and give our speakers a chance to to say a little bit more about these these issues of individual individuality, solidarity and identification. I, I could start, I suppose, and I think it's really, you know, um, Christina and Amber, the ways in which you responded and Amber you know, if that's you incoherent, it's just kind of an amazing sort of thing. So um, thank you for showing up for this, even when you're not feeling well. And there, there is something in the showing upness of that, yeah, um, and in joining us for the conversation that I think is itself part of what we're talking about in what, is it, what does it take to come to the table? What does it take to actually put your body forward? It, I mean, there is a way that you're actually living your own theory right now. The kind of sickness and the disaggregation, you know, the sort of um, disaggregation of a, a sense of wellness, right? A sense of being solid when you're ill that way. Um, I think there is something about that that, for me, as a teacher, you know, and I really love what you were talking about, Christine, in terms of pedagogy, because for me, everything comes back to curriculum and to the classroom. And it's one of the reasons that I'm really excited to stop being chair, is so that I can actually get back into the classroom as a teacher again. There are other reasons too, but that's actually a primary one. Um, and I think it's because in those spaces, we can actually let go of a sense of having to be coherent, right? Like if it's going well, and I know that sounds contrary because um, at least graduate seminars can also be a space of like heightened performativity, right? You know, I am the smartest one in the room. I have done all the reading and I can you know, take down that, that analysis better than anyone else. But if, if you can shape that conversation differently so that it really is, a, is um, a project of talking about the idea at the center rather than talking about whether or not it's um, talking about the, you know, the good, whether a book is good or not, whether an argument is good or not, right? Um, there, is a, there is a way that I think that is an enactment of the kind of pedagogy of um, impersonality that I'm talking about or that we are talking about in terms of entanglement or mutuality or you know, it, all of these different terms. So I think that it actually happens all the time. Like, I think we are already doing this all the time. And I do think that we're doing it by the way that we structure curricula and that we don't follow the 
you know, when you're teaching feminism in a class that's not designed that way, even when you're getting the hits, right? And the criticisms like, why are we reading so much feminist literature in this, you know? Um, um, but there's also always that problem of scale, right? And there's that problem of kind of this, the, the way that, that what we do in a space like a classroom, um, it does and doesn't impact what's happening in other places, right? Um, and I think that that for me is both an open question and it is about the kind of limitations of what academic um, intellectual work can do, but it is also really about saying, uh, what is the extent to which um, there are going to be those kinds of bridges that we're making from in and out so that the intellectual labor that happens on the streets every day, all the time, you know? Um, I've talked about this in other settings. I mean, I think about it in my family history, right? It was my mother who was the economic genius who actually took a very small amount of money that my father was bringing in and created life for the rest of us, right? So she is, for me, the model of what intellectual labor looks like that's actually hidden in domestic spaces, right? Um, so it, I, I don't necessarily, she would never want to be in a, in a classroom necessarily, right? Um, and it's kind of parochial for us to think that that has to happen, but rather that it's, you know, what can we do um, in order to enable our thinking to be enlivened by so that there can be a transit or kind of a circulation of knowledge. So that's one thing I would say. Yeah, yeah I might just follow um, and say thank you for that beautiful um, reflection, Candice. I think what struck me in reading, rereading um, Bridge and Brave, but also the panels that um, Melissa and I co-organized for the MLA, the roundtables, was just the way in which the classroom is and is not of the institution. Um, it is probably the most central space of a university, and it's also somehow oddly exceptional, almost like an analyst like session where it's like the same place every time, but it takes you to another place. Um, and I think that that the reflections I heard in those two roundtables, um, I'm thinking specifically of Summer Kim Lee's thinking of this through teaching and the way in which students arrive to bridge as too late, but also it's always on time. Um, that kind of, that the showing up of the text over time seems to also be a vital part of moving forward or Again, I think I've I quoted this in MLA, but I'll, I'll say it again. I, I'm thinking also with Barbara Christian a lot lately about feminist theory as a gathering place and that gathering place will always have antagonisms and incommensurabilities. But I do think that the particularity of the kinds of honest dialogue and um, reading of one another in Bridge is so profoundly, um, galvanizing in this moment of separateness and silo um, or 40 years after the intentions of bridge and then quite just on the heels of it brave for institutional spaces. I'm I think I still am thinking within the classroom as both in and out of, of those institutional places or as a space that kind of allows students to really see concepts like outsider within and the the kind of force of that just doesn't diminish yeah i mean it's um i think one of the things i mean i guess sort of obviously given what i talked about um i think one of the the most striking things for me reflecting on um, the volume 40 years later is just sort of what people are actually talking about um, and just sort of like the security in gaining knowledge from the way that one already is in the world. So, and which I think is its own profound pedagogical lesson, right? Like so much of what we talk about in, in my, you know, since I'm basically teaching black feminisms is, so how do we decenter X, Y, or Z? And then a lot of it is just sort of like, well, what counts as knowledge? You know, and you read these, um, you read these writings, and just thinking about, you know, people being like, "I am empowered to talk about um, my reflections on 
I don't know, whatever. Like, this is how I learned about racism. This is how I learned about that. Um, and so I feel like it's a different, you know, it's it's not, this, it's, it's I, I like the, that breaking of the form of what constitutes knowledge and sort of like where one can get it. Um, and it feels very empowering to, to break the institutional space, you know what I mean? To, um, that feels like another way of breaking down um, institutional space, I guess. I don't know that, I'm not sure where I'll go with that for coalition, but it feels like, um, yeah. You know, I, I think, I guess the other thing that I would say to that, and, and this maybe follows up on just the, the coalition part, is I, I, it's just not a term that resonates for me. And actually, sometimes, I mean, it, sometimes it feels closer to ally, um, which is also a term that doesn't work so well. And every once in a while, even solidarity, because I think that they, I don't know, there's something about an, the positing of an outsiderness to those relations, right? If I'm claiming that I am an ally to X, I'm saying that is a situation that I'm outside of. And I genuinely don't, don't believe that or feel that. So the belief feel thing for me is big. It's just not, um, I, don't, I don't have it in my body to conceive of myself in that way. And or when I do, the project seems to me to figure out, you know, why, why do I feel external to this? Right. Um, what is it that's that's producing that sense of um, alienation rather than saying, so therefore I should be an ally. It's well, wait a second. In what way is that an issue that is also something that I need to be accountable for right, or responsible to? Um, and that's a slightly different mode, I think. So I, I don't know. I mean, there's just something there about coalition that always kind of falls flat for me. So, so thank you. So we have um, we have about seven minutes, so certainly we could stay longer um, for questions from from people in attendance. Um, I mean, I could I could actually ask a question. Um, Candace, thinking about what you said about terms like coalition or allyship, I mean, I guess I'm, you know, I'm so struck by by the way that that, as as you said, does construct a sense of outsiderness versus centeredness, or you know, it were in a way there's. You know, it works against the kind of um, you know it 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 works against the kind of affinities or, or you know common causes that um, that you've argued it up for and and that I think we're all trying to think through and but I guess I'm kind of stuck on the question of what and maybe we don't need to call it anything right maybe just looking for for the term that captures it is um is maybe you know trying too hard to to have the right catchphrase but I'm wondering how would we talk about that kind of relationship without falling back to the kind of you know I know just what that that feels like identification. Yeah. I mean, I, I do, I, and it, it is absolutely the, the problem with that mode is the um, uh, existence lower force of the identitarian, right? And yeah. um, as if that is actually the only way um, to relate to, or the, the kind of most effective way to relate to a set of issues, a problem, a question, et cetera. Um, and if it, you know, I'm of the generation, I'm slightly older, actually, I could be considerably older, I don't know, than uh, both Christina and Amber, I think, but I'm of the generation that we, we really took seriously the critique of subjectivity, that we really actually took cri uh, the critique of identity politics very seriously. So um, that's not to say that I feel like I can jettison or opt out of it by any means, but rather to say that that, that can't be, I, I don't, I don't um, believe that that can be the foundation of um, a progressive politics that moves us forward, right? A progressive politics that moves us in different ways. And this for me has everything to do with um, queer of color critique, right? Um, 
and, and the kind of um, visions and language and, and modalities that that's made available. Um, so in terms of, you know, and I, so we can give specific examples of actually, I was rereading or revisiting um, Jody Bird's Transit of Empire recently. And I was thinking about um, the chapter um, where Bird is talking about uh, Japanese American intern internment, right? And a particular internment camp is taking place on indigenous lands that are then turned into a national park, right? Um, presumably, right, in the aftermath of, you know, internment happens, the US regrets it, it's a, a mistake of the past, then the solution is to turn it into a national park as a memorial, right? So in all of those different ways, it isn't because there is a, an identity between Japanese Americans and I think it was Lakota Indians uh, um, in this particular place, um, that, that that is a, an issue that is of concern for both, right? But actually it's exclusionary nationalism and US imperialism and settler colonialism. Um, that is the, the kind of common cause, right? So, I mean, it, you know, I'm framing it as a negation, but I think that when you see it in these kinds of broader frames, it becomes impossible to not then say, I'm actually accountable for settler colonialism. It isn't because that, you know, I was there doing that thing, but rather I am here because of that. Um, and so I, I don't I don't traffic in guilt. I'm not that interested in it. I think that's one of the things I appreciate about Bridge is that guilt is an intellectual mask, I think is a beautiful formulation and that you know we should recircle that all the time. Um, but I do think that that's there. You know, Asian American studies has long been um, uh, trying to address model minority politics, model mi minoritarianism, right? Which is always built on the idea that our success is related to the diminishment of other racialized subjects, right? Brown and black. Um, how could I not then make myself accountable to that system? Like, there's no way not to, right? So um, that's, that's the sensibility that I want to, um, I think it's worthwhile trying to cultivate. That, that actually everything that we think is a singular phenomenon is actually related to everything else that's going on. And when we start to cultivate that, right, then the questions that we're asking in a Black feminist theory class then resonate really strongly with the questions that we're asking in a UF Latinx class or in a you know, third world feminism class or however you know, we are framing it. And those kinds of networks and nodes, I think, start to emerge. Now, I actually think that there are associations and people on the ground who are already doing this work, who recognize that you know, the conditions of labor that are happening as a result of NAFTA are also related to the conditions of labor that are happening in uh, Chinese factories, right? Um, and that those two th phenomena, right, of groups very, very disparate from each other are really things that we actually have to think about in the same arc and the same framework. But we are behind, I think. We as an academics are behind in kind of catching up to what that might help us understand about how the world works and how these, you know, I mean, I do get stuck on implausibility sometimes. Like it is implausible that so many people should survive actually. Um, and in fact, should thrive that there's art and music and culture and politics and governance and, you know, all of those things that are happening from these places that like the state has really, really abandoned them very seriously and it's still happening. I mean, they're that, like, that's why I'm kind of like, Wow, we're, we're, it's us, you know, we don't have the language for it perhaps, but the practice is already there. And I don't know, I just, I, I think that that's both like, that's where the, you know, Parker thing is, it's really messy and not neat. And there's just a lot of work and a lot of, a lot of stuff that have to happen all over the place. That was the most eloquent that I can do. <laughs> that, a lot of stuff that has to happen. All over that the was very eloquent. I. <laughs> I um, just came from a class of where I was teaching Rod Ferguson's One Dimensional Queer, and uh, I wish I'd been as eloquent as you in, um, in you know, trying to think about the the possibilities of multidimensionality. So, and he, yeah. you know, Rod um, is, I think he's coming with Erica Edwards next, right, to to do your series, and you know, both of them are interlock long term interlocutors, you know, and Rod. Uh, there's all the things that I think in terms of institutions and relations and relationality um, are so indebted to the ways that he's thinking and also to all these other people who are not with us, right? Like that sense of the consciousness that is kind of precedes and exceeds where we are right now. Um, I want to hold on to that and I, not as the solution and not as the thing, right? But actually as a necessary part 
of what, um, what makes it possible for us to keep going despite this, right? Despite the fact that we're doing this, um, to try to attend to the deep inequities that, have, that we have, um, you know, that have been eliminated and they're being exacerbated in the current moment, right? How are we gonna attend to that as part of a third world women of color you know, queer feminist project um, is not a rhetorical question. It's actually like in practice, right? How are we getting food to people? We're just a little bit over time, but I wanted to give um, Amber and Christina a chance if, if you have any final thoughts about the questions that we've addressed today. Um, thank you so much. And um, I think just maybe to kind of tack on to the pressure against something like coalition, I do think that the uh, accountability that you see in Bridge is really, and Brave, is really beautiful. Um, and the ability to hold on to questions instead of giving answers, I'm also really quite taken by Ray Chow's um, recent book on the humanities and how the particular places where a lot of us dwell in the studies, right, women's studies, um, Black feminist studies, Caribbean studies, Asian American studies, were brought in as the cleanup crew uh, so that the rest of the, uh, the show can go on as it does. Um, I think that even just the affect of purchase of reading bridge of knowing this feminist struggle as one that is continuous and ongoing, knowing the kind of, again, I think what Brave and Bridge show us is the quotidian acts that don't get registered at, at high levels. Um, and maybe this is a bit of, of Amber's work on attunement as well. <clears throat> I'm going to leave it with what Christina said, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I do, but I think um, one of the registers also of attunement is just like what it is to, what it is to sort of sit with what one doesn't, what it is to sit with something without trying to produce mastery. Um, and I think that that's kind of, that's that's like the ethical impulse undergirding all of this, sort of like how to sit and not try to interpret or and objectify and all, you know, all of these types of things that happen um, and what kind of politics can be built from that, I think. I just, I really, I think that's such a beautiful project, Amber. And one of the reasons that I'm so excited about it is that it gets us, it lifts, the idea of agency up and it says uh, I'm, uh, we're not going to do that for form that's not what we're searching for but rather it's actually something that's not about will right it's really about bodily knowledge and that's so it's so beautiful and so wonderful that you're taking that on well again um and as Christine and Amber, thank you so much for being here today and, and for these really just, you know, I, I don't use this word a lot, but inspiring um, talks. I, I feel, you know, sort of uh, fortified and, and ready to face the world after this. So, so thank you for that. And, um, you know, thank you also uh, to Maria Murphy for all that she did to organize this, this event and, and bring these terrific speakers together. Um, so um, with that, I think we can conclude. And, and thank you to everyone who came and, and who stayed for the entire, um, the entire talk. I, I really appreciate you being here.